Hello everyone and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. It is the 11th of November and we're going to come again and we're in Hebrews chapter 6. But let's pause and pray before we start. Heavenly Father, thank you again for uh, another day that you have given to us. And thank you again for another opportunity to come and to look at your word together. Lord, as we open your word now, we just ask that you would quieten and still our hearts so that we would hear your voice that you would encourage us and challenge us and draw us closer to you through your holy spirit lord that we would come to know a bit more about you about your nature and about our relationship with you so that we would grow more mature in that relationship so father thank you and be with us now we pray in christ's name amen so last week um it was about being a bit more mature um and at the very end of the passage, the last week, the very end of the first half of Hebrews chapter 6, um, the verse ends like this, verse 12. Instead, you follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. So the writer introduced um, promise and what it is to have a promise. So let's read the rest of Hebrews chapter 6. That's verses 13 down to the end of verse 20. And then let's look at those verses together. For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that they would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Promises. Some of us are good at keeping promises. Some of us are not so good at keeping promises. Some of us um, can be, are trusted whenever we say yes or no to things. Other people can't be trusted. That's human nature at times. God's nature is completely different. God is perfect and not flawed like we are. And, and so the writer wants to remind us of how we can rely on God's promises. So he starts off, he wants to give the writers, he wants to give the hearers a practical example. So he talks about Abraham. And he talks about how there was God's promise to Abraham. And because there's no one greater, God took the oath on his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will not multiply your descendants beyond number. Abraham was given a promise that he had become the father of all nations, that he'd be blessed with more descendants than he could count, at a time whenever he had no children, at a time whenever he and his wife were both old. How can that happen? But yet it did happen. God blessed him. And God did use him to be a, a great nation. And then how the nation of Israel, how we get adopted into it. You, you, it's incredible, God's promise. And, and we have the, the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit of being able, years and years later, to be able to read the Bible, to be able to look back on that and see the promise. And to see how God kept his promise. It's interesting because... The writer talks about how there's no greater name, so God promises on his own name. You know, some people make promises uh, and things on people's names and on people's graves and, and all sorts of things in, in society these days. We can't trust anybody. We're all flawed. The only person who isn't is God. And that's why he says, I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. It says, then Abraham waited patiently and they received what God had promised. It might have taken time. Abraham didn't see it fully in his lifetime on earth, but saw it from heaven. 
you know, he was able to see how God fulfilled that promise, how God continues to fill, fulfill that promise uh, about his people. And as followers of Christ, now we know that we are God's people. We know that there is God's promise. And the writer goes on to say that <clears throat> now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. You know, there's no one greater than God. There's no one who is more perfect, more able. There's no one else who we can rely upon other than God. The writer goes on to say, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise would be perfectly sure he would never change his mind. What could the writer be talking about? Well, he's talking about the promise of Jesus and the promise of salvation. Look at Jesus' own words in John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. There's a promise in that. And it goes on in the next verse to say that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved or would be saved. God gave a promise, an oath as well, that if we follow Christ, if we have personal faith, if we open our lives to God and let him in, that we are his it talks about us being adopted into God's family. Um, Revelation talks about our name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's a promise, an oath there, that if we accept God, he accepts us. That if we let Jesus in, then what Jesus has done for us on the cross, by bringing and giving us God's grace, can never be taken away from us again. How often do we promise something to somebody and then we don't do it? Or how often we say, oh, if you do that, I'll give you such and such. You know, classic one with kids. Oh, if you do that, then I'll give you a reward. I'll give you a treat. And maybe they have one idea and we have a different idea. Or maybe we tell them we'll give them something and we don't actually go through with it. We break our word. We break our promise. God doesn't break his promise. And, you know, the, the more mature that we get in our faith, the more that we get to, to, to understand God, the more that we realise who God is and what he has done for us, the more we realise that we can actually trust him, that we can rely upon him, that if God says he will do something, he will do it. Now, that's a two-edged sword as well, so to speak. In the Old Testament, God time and time again warns his people, if you don't turn away from me, I will punish you. And he does in the end. In the end, he loses patience. He gives them enough chances and he punishes them. And the, the nation of Israel is, is, and, and Judah there destroy those nations. Jerusalem is completely destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And the temple effect never gets rebuilt. God promises us in, in Revelation that there is judgment coming. And if we don't accept it, then that is the cost. But there's also the promise of a new heaven and a new earth for those of us who do follow. So God's promises are true and there's many promises still to be fulfilled. But one promise which is very active at this time is the promise of grace. And like I say, the, the the older, the longer that we follow, the more time we spend following God and actually looking at that, then we realise that it's true. We realise that we can trust him. Verse 18, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. There you are, there's part of God's nature. You know, at one point the Bible says that your yes be yes and your no be no. You know, if, you're going to, if you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. Speak the truth. Why? Because God doesn't lie. God always tells the truth. If he tells us he's going to do something, he will do it. It says, therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Again, we sort of lose the meaning of that word hope. Um, in this world that we live in nowadays, we, we talk so often, oh, I, I, I hope that this is going to happen. 
Um, you know, particularly at the minute, oh, we, we hope that everything will be okay for Christmas. We hope that our young people here at university will get home okay. Um, you know, I hope everyone's going to be all right. That word hope in today's context, context means something completely different from the hope in the Bible. That hope in the Bible, we hold hope, we hold to the hope that lies before us. It's not a hope, it's a promise. It's something which you can rely upon. It's something which you can trust. Um, so much so it goes on to say this, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Can you imagine having hope like that? A strong and trustworthy anchor for our hope, for our souls. In other words, it holds our souls, it holds on to us. It doesn't let go. That's what God's promise is to us. You know, whenever we accept Christ, whenever we become a Christian, whenever we become a follower, he holds on to us and he never lets go. He never discards us and throws us away. He will always hold us. Yes, at times we can rebel. Yes, at times we can turn our back and we can, we can kick and scream against God and we can pull in the opposite direction. But he never lets go of us. And again, the more mature in God that we become, the more we realise that's true. Because the more we realise that life is full of ups and downs, highs and lows. We have times whenever we feel so good and we feel so strong in our faith and walking with God. There's also times whenever we really struggle, times whenever we feel so far away from God. But God is not far away from us. God never leaves us. You know, the Old Testament promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. Um, or I, for I hold you by the right hand, I the Lord your God. And I say, do not be afraid for I am here to help you. All those promises are true. They were true in the Old Testament. They're true now for us. And the more mature in God we become, the more we realise that. And the more we realise it's not a hope, but it's a complete trust and confidence in God. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love that phrase, um, that our hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It talks about it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Wow. Being able to go into the presence of God. Because that's what it meant to go into the inner sanctuary. Go to the place where God's presence is. A place which is holy and special. A place that the high priest could only go once a year. And everybody else could never go. And yet we have access to that place. It says Jesus has already got in there for us. Jesus died on the cross, talks about the, tur the curtain in the temple, which separated that inner place from the rest of the temple, being torn into from top to bottom. And I like to think of that as God's hand reaching down and breaking that barrier to say, you can now come in. And it's talked about Jesus, and he's become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And the next few verses go on to speak about Melchizedek. What an amazing relationship we have with God. What an amazing God we have to begin with. But what an incredible relationship we have and can have with God. Because of Jesus. Because of the promises which God made a long time ago. Even right the way back in Genesis. Whenever Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. Uh, and was talking about how the serpent would how Eve's offspring would crush his head and how he would bite at the ankle of the offspring. You know, a promise about Jesus coming to defeat sin and that promise that runs right the way through the Old Testament and then we see it fulfilled in Jesus. A promise which never is broken, a promise which never goes away, a promise which we claim whenever we accept Christ as saviour. Wow, amazing. And then to say something like um, that our high priest is in the order of Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek's already been mentioned in Hebrews and Melchizedek gets mentioned again. So let me read the first few verses of chapter 7 to you. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also priest of God most high. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. 
Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice. A king of Salem means king of peace. So Melchizedek was an unusual character. He was a king and he was also the priest. That's who Jesus is to us. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is heir to the throne. Jesus sits at God's right hand. And, you know, Jesus is God. God is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You know, the whole idea of Trinity, um, three people in one. But that, that whole idea of who Jesus is. And even looking at Jesus as the man who came to earth. He died for our sins. He rises into heaven. He sits at God's right hand. He intercedes for us. He, 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 he says, you know, he, he says, says to God, my blood has been shed for that person. So in that respect, he's the high priest. Because the high priest went in every year and sprinkled blood over what was called the atonement site. So in the inner part of the temple, uh, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And then there was two statues made, um, two cherubims with, with gold wings stretched out. And those wings stretched out and, and from one side of the inner sanctuary to the other. And the wings met in the middle under which the Ark sat. And where those wings were over the ark, that was called the atonement seat. And that's where the priest went in, the high priest went in once a year and sprinkled blood for the sins of the nation. Now Jesus has done that for us. Jesus shed his blood for us to take away all our sins for all time. So that's why Jesus is called the high priest. And as such, he serves us in the presence of God. But he's also king, he's also ruler. Jesus has been around since the creation of time. So he's also king. So, you know, quite often we talk about, and there's a song talks about, I'm um, servant king, singing about Jesus. And it's so true. Jesus is the servant king. He came to serve us, but also to be our king. And, you know, and Jesus even models that to his own disciples. Um, again, as he went to wash the disciples' feet, he said, those of you who, you know, do, you know, take, up, take my example, wash the feet of others. If you want to be a great leader, then you must serve. And it's that idea of what Christ has done for us. And again, as we become more mature in our faith, then we realise more and more it's not about us. It's not about how great we are because we're not great. We are flawed and faulty. But it's about how we serve God's and serve others because that's what shows other people how God loves them and cares for them. That's what speaks so much about God's love and how as we take on that servant heart, how it glorifies God and how it brings honour to him. Melchizedek did it and we'll, we'll think about him again next week. But Melchizedek did that as being the, as the, the servant and the king a king of, of Salem, but also the high priest. But he served God. You know, to think about being mature means serving God. To think about being mature means getting to know the nature of God better. It also means getting to know about our own selves better and about our own relationship with God. We need to open up about that to God. We need to be honest about that to God. We need to hand things over to God. To let God into every part of our lives is being mature as well. To let him have that control, or that sense of flavor, let him, let him guide us in every aspect of life is being mature. How good are we at that? Hmm. Not very good at times, I would say. I trust and pray that you're not just a Sunday only Christian, that you just don't let God on a Sunday and the rest of the week you lead, you lead your life the way you want to. Being mature means leading our life the way God wants us to lead it. And yes, we go about our daily tasks, we go about our daily lives, we go, we go about the, the jobs that we have or our family situations, we go about all of that in a normal day-to-day -day routine, but it's bringing the flavour of God through with that. It's bringing that flavour of being trustworthy, um, God doesn't lie, so we shouldn't lie. God can be trusted, we should be trusted. God made promises which he kept, we should be able, our promises should be kept. 
People should be able to rely upon us. We're not getting it right all the time, but the more we rely upon God, then the more that that will happen, that we do get it right. And the closer we grow, we, we grow to God, and then the more effective we are at actually showing people who God is and what he has done for us. Be mature. Be mature in your faith. Be mature in your walk. Be mature in your understanding of who God is. Let's pray together. Father, thank you once again for your word. Thank you again for the challenges that it brings to us, for the encouragement that it brings to us, just for the sense of being able to grasp a little bit about who you are and how you love us and care for us and then how we can reflect that in our relationship with you and in our relationship with others. Father, may our word be trustworthy. May our word be true. Help us each day to live for you, we pray. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me again. Uh, I trust that this incoming week for you again is, is blessed and it's full and um, that you stay safe. And God willing, see you again next week. All right, take care. God bless. Bye.